Wasn't that beautiful? I just think it's so beautiful when, uh, when God's people get together and just celebrate the beauty of Jesus Christ. And don't forget, that's what this is about. It's not about the beauty of the lights and the trees, and we'll talk about that. But it's about the beauty of Jesus Christ and the fact that he became God incarnate. That simply means he just took on human form. He took on flesh, and he became uh, the light of the world. And so uh, it's so good to see you here tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, you all look beautiful tonight. You look like you're having a good time. And I'm so excited for you about uh, this celebration and about Christmas. This is my favorite time of the year. But as I'm reminded uh, constantly during this season from members of our church, and I talked with someone just right before the service tonight that just just in the last couple of months or so, lost her father. And so there are people that when it comes to celebrating Christmas, it brings pain. Not that the Christmas story brings pain, but the fact that they've lost a loved one, they've lost a husband, they've lost a wife, they've lost a dad or a mom or a, a son or a daughter or a friend. And so I, I think the solution for that, for all of us, and, and once again, it's okay to be sad. It's okay uh, to be sad during uh, these holiday seasons. That does not mean you don't love Jesus. That doesn't mean that you're not celebrating Jesus. But I think the solution is to see Jesus for who he is. And in the middle of your pain, realize that he never leaves us or forsakes us. He is always, always with us. He does not promise that we will not go through valleys. He does not promise that we will not experience pain, but he does promise that every step of the way, he will be with us. And that's what we celebrate tonight. Well, a couple of Sundays ago, we started a series called Light. And the first Sunday, we talked about that Jesus is the light of the world. And then last week, we talked about an incredible thing that Jesus said. He said, you are the light of the world. That is not your, the, not the source of the light, but a reflection of it. And so tonight, for just a few minutes, I want to be a blessing to you and uh, talk about the power of light. Now, light has great power. And the fact that Jesus said we are the light of the world uh, tells us how much he believes in the power of light, the power of his light. Isn't it amazing? It is to me that Jesus chose us. He put the fate of the world in our hands. Now, we don't do the saving by, in, by any stretch of the imagination. Jesus does the saving. He did everything that was necessary. You don't earn it. You don't do good things to earn God's favor or God's love. He loves you. There's no way he could love you any more than he does already right now. But the fact is, he says, you are the light of the world. He puts this responsibility on us. And it's incredibly important. Light dispels darkness. That's one of the things that it does. As light of the world, our job is to dispel darkness. In other words, we're to shine in the dark places. You know, it's easy to shine on Sunday morning. It's easy to shine when you're gathered at church. I mean, let's be honest. Most of us We've experienced this. We didn't feel like being in church. And, uh, you know, we just kind of put on a little bit because we just didn't feel like we were just kind of up to par when we went to church. And to be honest, we felt a little bit hypocritical about it. But the fact is, we are uh, the light of the world. It's easy to shine when there's lots of lights shining around you. But where God has called us to shine most is in the darkness. Uh, light has great power. It gives life. And when it's focused, it can cut through steel, a laser. And so I want to just read to you uh, a couple of uh, passages that are actually not typically part of the Christmas story, but I believe that because Jesus is the light of the world and we celebrate light at Christmas time, I believe this is incredibly appropriate. Romans chapter 13, and I'll read three verses from that passage. And uh, this is the Apostle Paul writing. He said, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come 
for you to wake up from sleep. Now, it's good to take a nap. Some of you are going to settle down for a long winter's nap tonight. Some of you parents or grandparents, your kids or grandkids are going to wake you up really early in the morning, so you need to get in bed, all right? But he says here, not that you get a good night's sleep, but stop slumbering. Stop sleeping on the job is what he's saying. He says, you know the time that hour has come for you to wake up from sleep for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believe. He's really talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ there. Then he goes on and, and, and says this, the night is far gone. The day is at hand. Does it ever feel like to you that the night is far gone? Maybe it's getting darker. Maybe it's, uh, it seems like there's so many things. And, and do you ever just say what John the Apostle, when he ended the book of Revelation, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. You ever feel that way? Well, he says that we live in that day. So he said, what do you do? Do you curse the dark? You know, there are a lot of Christians that think that's the way you spread the gospel. You curse the darkness. That has never worked. Not once. Jesus did not come uh, and to spread the light of his good news. He didn't curse the darkness. You know what he did? He lit a light. And that's what we are to do. So he says, let us cast off the works of darkness. That is the, the attitude, the thinking, the way of living of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now, I want you to see what he said. We've got to recognize where we are. We're in a time of need, right? We're, we're in a time when the world needs light. The world needs Jesus. We're in a time of need. We've got to recognize it. And then we've got to prepare. We've got to get ready. Now, you are a light whether you're ready or not. Whether you're a good light or a bad reflection determine, is determined by how you live. Okay? But he says uh, we're to be prepared. But then, you know what we've got to do? We've got to execute. We've got to go out and do it. You don't have to be perfect. In fact, um, many people are so religious. And Jesus did not come to get you some religion. He did not come for religious purposes. He came to bring dead things to life. He came to bring light into darkness. That's why he came. He didn't come to make you moral. Now, don't misunderstand. You should be moral. I'm not suggesting you should go and be immoral. But the truth of the matter is that's not why Jesus came. He came to save people that need saving. He came to save people from darkness. He came to bring light to those that are in spiritual darkness. So he says, we got to execute. we got to do it. And let me just kind of tell you where part of what Paul wrote here came from. It came from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. When he talks about this armor of light. Also in the book of Ephesians where it talks about putting on the whole armor of God. You familiar with that? Where he talks about the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith. And the sword of the spirit and the shoes of good news and girding your loins about with truth. Uh, that comes from Isaiah chapter 59. And I want to read it to you just quickly. Uh, because this is the prophet Isaiah talking about the light that was to come. Talking about the fact that the Messiah would one day come. Talking about the fact that one day Jesus would be here among us. He would put on flesh. He would physically come so that he could die for our sins. So uh, look at what it says in Isaiah 59. The Lord saw it. Now you have to understand what was said before that he's talking about really the wickedness. He saw sin. He saw spiritual darkness. He saw people that were dying and going to hell. He saw people that were not saved. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. Don't ever forget God's not angry with you. Don't ever forget when it comes to the gospel, understanding the gospel um, God does not leave sin unpunished. Now, you can choose to 
receive that punishment, if you will. But I'm so glad that God punished my sin on the cross through Jesus Christ. And he would not be a just God if he did not punish sin. But thank God, God saw to it that justice would come. Listen to what he said. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. There was no one capable. There was no one that could bring justice. There was no one that could bring forgiveness. And then, I love this, his own arm brought him salvation. God looked and he said, nobody can do it. And Jesus said, I'll go. I'll do it. I'll be the one. And his righteousness upheld him. And notice how he begins to talk about this armor. He put on righteousness as a breastplate. In other words, he was sinless. He came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He came to live the life that we did not, could not, would not live. He lived a perfect life, a sinless life. He did that for us. He fulfilled the, uh, the righteous requirements of the law. He put on his uh, breastplate of righteousness and a helmet of salvation on his head. Aren't you glad for that salvation? Aren't you glad that Jesus brings salvation? He says, you put it on like a helmet. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing. By the way, he's not putting on those garments of vengeance for you. Well, he's doing it in your place. But he's not seeking vengeance on you. Now, understand, those that reject Christ, uh, they're going to taste of God's righteousness of his judgment. They're going to taste of punishment. But they don't have to because he did it for you. He said he put on vengeance for clothing, garments of vengeance. You know who his vengeance is against? It's against the devil. It's against sin. He wants to crush it. Do you know why God hates sin so much? Because it separates you from him. That's why he hates it. The fact is, he doesn't hate you, but he hates the sin. He will put on garments of vengeance for clothing. He wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Look, if it were not for his zeal, his passion for us, he would not have gone to the cross. He put on these garments of zeal. What was that? Why was that? Well, the Bible tells us that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You see, the cross was not pleasant. It was, and we often uh, equate the cross with the physical suffering of Jesus. And no doubt he did suffer physically. But that is not the suffering that Jesus went through. Lots of people have died of crucifixion. Lots of people have been tortured in death. Lots of people have had extreme pain in death. But what was so painful for Jesus was that the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the one who had created humankind, the one that had spoken the worlds into existence, the one that loved us so much that he came, what happened? He didn't just die for our sins. That is an incomplete picture of the gospel. The Bible says that he became our sin. He didn't just take it on, but the righteous, holy, perfect Son of God became sin for us, the one who knew no sin. So he, he wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak, and according to their deeds, so will he repay wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, and by the way, you don't have to be the enemy of God. When you receive Jesus Christ, you're no longer an enemy. You are a son. You are a daughter. You're a king and a priest. You are a part of his royal family. Thank God. Because he's going to take vengeance on his enemies, on the devil. Uh, wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, to the coastlands, he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west. And his glory from the rising of the sun. In other words, from the east. So his glory is going to go from the west 
to the east. You know where the Bible talks about as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Now that's a very poetic way of saying that he removes it to infinity. You see, you can start on a globe and you can trace your finger down and you'll go south until you hit the south pole. And then if you keep on going, you're going to start going north again. So there's a limited scope for south and north. South, north. South, north. But did you know that you can start going east on a globe? And if you keep on going, you will never, ever, ever, ever end. You start going west, it's the same thing. In other words, he removes our sin from infinity to infinity. Thank God for the righteous name of Jesus. Um, and it says, he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. Talking about the Holy Spirit here. And we'll close with this. A redeemer will come to Zion. Zion being the city of God. Uh, metaphorically, uh, he's coming to that place of spiritual connection and forgiveness and reconciliation with the Father. He literally came to a real city, a city called Jerusalem. But he said, and a Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declare, declares the Lord. You know what this tells me? We've got to trust the Savior. That's why Jesus came. We've got to put on the armor you want to be ready, you want to be light, you got to prepare, you got to put on the armor, but thank God, you got to rest in the Redeemer. You see, it's not my works that save me, it's not my works that justify me, it's not my works that reconcile me to the Father. You can be as good as you can possibly be, and it will not be good enough. The Bible says, all have sinned. All have sinned. And in case you're wondering what that word all means in the original Greek, it means all. It means everybody. It means you. And it means me. He says all have sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So I don't care how good you are, how many churches you join, how many old ladies you help across the street. You will never be able to be good enough. But thank God Jesus is good enough. Jesus died in our place. He was our substitute. And according to Scripture, the Bible says, it uses a word called justified or justification. If you don't know what that means, it means that when God sees you, He only sees the works of Jesus. When you become a follower of Christ, when you uh, turn to Him in faith, uh, the Bible is very clear. You become justified. I heard one preacher say it this way. It is just as if I'd never sinned. And that's not the full definition of justification. Justification means that he looks at you and treats you like you have never sinned. But that's not the end of justification. Here's the thing. He guarantees that you will never, ever, 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 ever again be guilty of sin in the eyes of the Father. Now, do we sin after we get saved? Of course we do. But justification means that you have been placed in right standing with the Father. And no matter what you do, no matter how many times you fall, no matter how much you fail, no matter how discouraged you may get, no matter how often you may sin, you have been justified. And when God looks at you, you know what he sees? He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees forgiveness, and he does not see a person that is going to be separated from him forever in hell. He sees a person that is going to live with him forever in the abode of God. And the good news is, you can have that. Every person can have that. You say, how do you get it? Well, it's not by effort. It's not by being good, because you can't be good enough. You can't reach high enough. But... The Bible tells us that God pursues us. You ever feel that tug in your heart? You hear a preacher preach, you hear the word of God read, 
and something in your head, something in your heart speaks to you. Man, I need to do this. Man, I need to pray. That's the Holy Spirit. Uh, people don't think that God speaks to them. Well, maybe he's never audibly spoken to you. If he ever woke you up in the middle of the night uh, and spoke to you in an audible voice, it would probably scare most of us absolutely to death. And I've never heard the audible voice of God. I have sensed that God was speaking to me many, many, many times. And tonight, if you know that you need what I talked about, you need Jesus as the light in your life. That's God speaking to you. That's God drawing you to him. And so tonight, on Christmas Eve, the greatest gift you could give your family, the greatest gift you could give yourself is the gift of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. We know that. Every one of us is going to die one day if God tarries his coming. You're going to have your funeral one day. So will I. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's a gift. And you can have that gift on Christmas Eve tonight. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help every person in the room tonight to receive that gift. I know that many have already received it. And if there are those that have not yet received it, I pray that tonight would be the night. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us all to understand the reason for what we're doing here tonight, the reason for this season. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.